technical <laughs> difficulties don't happen as often as they used to in the old days. Remember when we first started with PowerPoints? Like, ooh, we almost expected that to happen. But um, anyway, glad to see all of you here. My name is Odessa Carr. I'm going to be the first presenter. I um, am, well, let's see, we have Mark DeLucido. Where is Mark? There's Mark DeLucido. Jeff Shalom just stepped out of the doorway, I think. All three of us are with the University of Arizona at the Cooperative Extension Office in Yalapai County. We have an office in Prescott, 840 Rodeo Drive. And then we also have a brand new office opened up here in Camp Verde. We had an office prior in Camp Verde, in uh, Cottonwood. But we moved to, um, it's close to the, out of Africa, um, by the juvenile detention center, that whole county complex over there. We have an office there, so close to, uh, a lot of you are probably from the Verde Valley. Some of you are not, I know that. But uh, anyway, I wanted you to, to know that we are here locally as a, as a resource. So, um, I had the Water Resource Program, and so this is, of course, <laughs> we're going to be, I'm really, really glad to see this interest in rainwater harvesting. Um, so the plan, and Jeff Shalau is our county director and agent, Jeff. Hi. Um, so, just a little bit of house, um, housekeeping. This is a great facility. I've never been here before, and it's wonderful. I've only driven down the road. The bathrooms are right outside the door. And um, we'll be taking a break. We have three presenters. I'll go first, then Mark, then Jeff. And we're going to go for approximately 50 minutes and then have a 10 minute break following each speaker. That will be an opportunity for you to visit the vendors we have. Uh, they add so much value to a workshop, workshop like this. So these are. Um, a lot of you probably know some of these local folks, but they're going to, you know, you can visit their tables uh, to get an idea of what's here locally for you in terms of uh, supplies for if you wanted to put in a rainwater catchment system or do passive rainwater or plant some of those beautiful plants back there. <laughs> so, um, and then, so we're, we're going to go from 9 to 12. Um, after the third session, there will be an opportunity for all those vendors to come up and tell you, speak uh, and introduce themselves in, um, in a more formal way and tell you what they have available and what they're doing locally in terms of rainwater harvesting. Um, so anyway, we go from 9 to 12. We're going to take a break uh, for lunch, and lunch is on your own. And then from 1.30, we're going to meet back here, and we're going to carpool out to various locations to do some field visits. And those will be led by Chris Anderson. Um, I really thank Chris for, for putting that part of it together. We had a, this is our second rainwater harvesting workshop that we have done at Extension. We did one about a month ago in Prescott. We had a great turnout, a lot of interest as well. And so the point of, of uh, is it was just really nice to have that complement of the field visits with the classroom instruction. Uh, it added so much. So anyway, thank you, Chris, for, for being willing to lead that portion. Let's see. So everybody has a packet. Let's just talk briefly about what's in your packet. Uh, before we do break for lunch, um, I would like to have you fill out the evaluation that's on the right-hand side of your packet. Pardon me. They're on the table back there. Actually, you one. Anybody else need a packet? All right. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, packets and the sign in table was over there. I didn't know whether they were there or there. They were over there. Um, they were anyway. Anyway, at the last workshop that we did, um, a lot of people didn't go on the afternoon field visits and we didn't get their evaluations. Um, so so we'd, we'd love to get your input on, on what you'd like to see in future workshops. Have you evaluate this one? It's always good for us to know, you know, what, how, how can we better serve the community? So, um, so you've got the agenda on the left-hand side. You have this is a publication that some of you may have already seen. It's a uh, put out by the um, by the Department of Extension, Patricia Waterfall. Don't you love that name, Waterfall? <laughs> I just wanted, this is a great little guide uh, that I definitely hope 
hope you'll spend some time with. And there are plans for building your own uh, tank from scratch. So, you know, we're always looking at ways, you know, just different ways that you can um, implement some of the things that you're going to be te uh, learning about this morning. And so there definitely are plans for developing your own system from scratch. Um, anyway, I just wanted you to see that there are some really good resources in there. Um, the other thing is that all of you are going to go home with a rain gauge. Okay. Yeah, a very, very nice rain gauge that uh, it's one of the best ones that I've found. Um, a little bit later in my presentation, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, a program that we have at the, at the university called Rain Log. And basically, you become a citizen scientist by collecting data, uh, rain uh, data, when there's rain, right? <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, when we're talking about catching rain, it's really worthwhile to know how much rain actually came down and how much yield you might, how much water might have entered your tank or entered your soil, say, for instance, right? I mean, how many of us guess, right? Oh, it was raining cats and dogs. It felt like two inches. Well, guess what? It was a quarter of an inch. You know how that works, right? So it's really helpful to have an accurate way of measuring. All right. Well, I ahead and start my presentation. Any, any questions so far? All right. Obviously, there's a lot to cover. We could, you know, that's what we're hoping, too, is that after this presentation, you, uh, just wherever your, um, your interests lie, you know, we might develop a totally different kind of rainwater harvesting workshop. Maybe we have a hands-on workshop where we go out in the field and build a tank, or who knows? Something for everybody, right? Yes. Uh, so where's the carpooling going to take us? Um, the plan is to, uh, you would, would you like to tell Chris where we're just briefly where we're going? I sure. should ask you, but maybe you'd be better. Uh, we're going to go to Cottonwood City Hall where there's a tank installed. We're going to go to Clarkdale in the town or the, the town hall area where uh, rainwater tanks and um, an earthworks system is getting put in place. We're going to go to a residence in Clarkdale, and we're going to go to a residence in, um, so the residence in Clarkdale will be uh, rain barrels and some water harvesting and earthworks. And then out in, in Cornville, we'll be going to a site that has uh, rainwater tanks, rainwater harvesting in, in the soil and earthworks, and also a gray water system. Great. Okay, that sounds good. And We'll start from here, we'll come back here. Um, some of you may or may not be able to go on the whole, um, the whole route, but um, we'll, we'll hope that you can. Okay, let's see. Okay, so rainwater harvesting, what is it? <laughs> Basically, it's, it's capturing precipitation that falls in, <coughs> on site. Um, so there are, you'll hear people talk about passive systems. Passive, essentially, your storage is in the soil. And then active systems, um, you're, you're capturing that water. Is that I think we'll yes. need a little bit yeah. of light just for that if they want to take notes. Is that good for you? I don't want you to fall asleep either. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to take away about half of it. Yeah. As long as we can see, that's good. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Um, Mark DeLucido, when he does his presentations, he's going to really be giving you the nuts and bolts of, of the system, the components, and um, if you were going to do either passive or active rainwater harvesting. And then Jeff is going to be addressing soils, because, well, anyway. Okay, so the water cycle. Not a bad thing to start with. Um, precipitation, you know what? <coughs> Very much, does very much of it actually infiltrate into the ground in our area? Yeah. No. Nope. Not very much. Most of it just runs off. That sheet flow and off it goes down into the drainages and heads south and we don't even see it, right? So, okay, well, guess what? Rainwater harvesting has been around for a heck of a long time. Not only hundreds of years, but let's say thousands of years. It's been practiced on every single continent. Um, this is one in Petra, Greece, uh, dates back to a couple 
thousand years ago. Um, hey, guess what? Nature does it. There's a pitcher pond up there capturing the runoff or rain as it falls on the site. Zuni Waffle Gardens, our native people here in the southwest, they did check dams along the drainages. Um, just north of Shields Ranch, I, I actually worked, uh, it's been about five years ago, we did an archaeological survey of waffle gardens that were quite extensive, just north of the Shield Ranch, just north of the Marie River. And uh, Peter Pillis, the Forest Service archaeologist for the Coconino, he got so excited, he said, I think this is going to be the largest agricultural site in the whole southwest. So anyway, rain falling down, capturing that runoff, keeping it from moving off site, and holding soil, holding water, benefiting plants, and you know, obviously you're trying to raise some crops. Uh, this is an example of Bolivia terracing definitely is one way of slowing down the runoff and also just uh, work being able to farm on steep slopes and slowing down erosion and such. Uh, Pompeii. Uh, Pompeii. The, this is a uh, what's the name? Compluvium, I think. I can't remember the name of it, but houses were built around a central courtyard and the eaves of the roof drain towards that central courtyard. And guess what? That's less water that you had to haul from further away, right? Um, they also captured water off the of roads. And so uh, the Romans learned a lot of their technology from the Greeks. The Greeks learned it from the Minoans. I mean, and this, so uh, they saw a good thing when they, you know, they were out conquering the world. Like, whoa, we'll bring some of those these good ideas back home. Um, and uh, some go back in India. This is a cistern. Can you believe how elaborate the cistern is? The photo's not the best quality there, but that's a. I've read that some of these cisterns, you could float a boat. You do a boat tour on them. They're so they're so big. Um, Peru. It was kind of interesting to to do a little research and prep for this because um, in Peru. Before it, they sighted Machu Picchu, they went out and looked at the springs. They, they found a place where there were seven springs. They actually developed those springs. They put infiltration galleries to cause those springs to flow at an even greater rate. And then they built the town. And they had running water coming into the town, into the city of Machu Picchu. Qumran National Park, that's another sister. So it's been done. It is a proven thing. Why did we get away from it? Well, partly is we started engineering these big projects, right? Um, the, the Bureau of Reclamation um, certainly has a reputation for having built amazing uh, waterworks, right? So damming up rivers. Seemed like we would have this endless supply of water, right? And not only did we start uh, capturing some of this runoff for later use, definitely, I mean, there were lots of advantages to doing this kind of thing because you're holding water inside, um, in place for times when there isn't very much available. Um, you're also, there's some flood control, uh, flood mitigation, flood mitigation. Um, another thing that happened too is we, developed pumps that had the ability to reach deeper groundwater, right? When people settled, when they were looking to settle in a place, they normally settled by a stream where they settled where they could dig shallow wells. And um, But later on, um, actually this was part of some technology de developed in the mining industry, we were able to actually go deeper, pull out water from deeper in the ground, <coughs> And wow, it just seemed like there was this limitless supply as to what was available. Okay? So, but you know what? We kind of got separated <coughs> from, I don't know, that kind of separates us. You start feeling very blase about water. Like, wow, we got so much. Life is good. We never have to worry about it again. Oh, well, think again. Okay, why are we going back to it? Well, because this is happening around the world. Water supplies are stressed. We've got a lot of people living on the planet. 
Water quality is impaired. Water quality is a big issue around the world. This photo right here, that's taken in Haiti after the big earthquake. And I love this. This is just a simple little catchment with a one gallon jug, a little canvas. I've been to Haiti. I've worked down there uh, many years back, waiting for this. But um, they get a lot more rainfall than we do. And so, you know what? When it rains, you capture it and you've got clean drinking water because rainwater is distilled water, essentially. Okay, and then some other photos wrecked right from around the world. Many places that have, have limited water supplies are harvesting rainwater. That's true in the past. That's true now. Um, I have had people say, you know, well, wait a minute, we don't get enough rainfall around here. To, I mean, are you kidding? <laughs> well, actually, when you look back and you study what's been done around the world, all these different work, these projects, oftentimes they were in very arid places. Chris just went to Israel. Did you go to Israel? Jordan and Israel. Jordan and Israel, yeah, to study, to see what they do. And you know some of these places have a lot less lot rainfall than we do, um, and and then there are places too, um, say like in the Virgin Islands. I also talked with uh, somebody who lived up in Juneau. Um, uh, the case in Juneau was such that they lived on the it was the town was built on basalt. This portion of the town was built on basalt, and there was no possibility of putting in the infrastructure to deliver water from a central location. So everybody had their own rainwater catchment systems. In a lot of uh, islands that are um, just basically not very far above sea level, um, if you were to drill for groundwater, guess what? You pull groundwater out, you're going to soon be bringing in salt water. So a lot of islands that don't have very um, much relief have a real problem, and guess what? Puerto Rico, they, they, uh, there's a lot of rainwater harvesting there. The Virgin Islands, Australia, you've probably heard of how Australia is really addressing their um, water uh, needs through rainwater harvesting. So do we have some of the same issues here? Yeah, well, guess what? The Colorado River, it's all spoken for. Um, we do have discussions sometimes about, okay, you know what? The Navajo and Hopi, they're gonna have their water rights settled finally and have some rights to the water um, out of Lake Powell. And yay, we wanna get in line and maybe deal with them and bring it here. Well, you know what? It costs a lot of money to pump water <laughs> uphill, over the canyon, up another hill. <laughs> Rainwater harvesting, guess what? You can try. It's right there on site. Um, we need groundwater supplies are stressed. Here. Let's just look about our look at our situation briefly. And so here is Prescott right here. We're over here in the Purdy Valley. Right about in here. So the way to read this is that if you look at these lines, this gets between 15 inches. Well, right here, if you look right here, it'd be between 15 and 20 inches of precip a year. Down here in the Verde Valley, it's about 15 inches a year. I live in Chino Valley, so we get about between 10 and 15 inches of rain a year. Okay, so that's averaged over you know, many, many years of keeping records. Now, take a this. I want you to remember that. Around 15 inches. Guess how much water evaporates? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have a little pond or a swimming pool? And you know that, I mean, every day, about two inches disappears into the air. Um, so here we are again. Let's talk about between, you know, the Verde Valley over here. 58 to 60 inches of water evaporates a year. So we are in a high desert and the definition of a desert is when you have more evaporation than you have precipitation coming. There's a lot of different other ways to define a desert but that's the primary one. You have a deficit 
you have, we have so much sun, so much solar radiation. You know what happens when it, after a storm? What happens next? The sun comes out, <laughs> and whoo, that, that soil becomes very dry all of a sudden, doesn't it? It's in a hurry, generally. <clears throat> I just wanted to um, show you this as well. I mean, Arizona is such a wonderful place in terms of the diversity that it has, plant diversity. Um, we have this great range in elevation, and so it rains more in the mountains, it's cooler in the mountains. And if you go down, we all know, we have had the experience of going down to the low elevation areas, and the vegetation changes dramatically, right? But here you go, low Sonoran, three to 12 inches of rain a year. Upper, upper Sonoran, 10 to 20 inches of rain a year, and so forth. Um, this is actually, I'll just spend a minute on this, the life zone con concept. Seahart Miriam was a, bot a botanist who came out here in the early, hmm, right around the turn of, well, 1900 or so. And he did an ex expedition up the San Francisco peaks from the base to the summit. And he realized that as he was going through these different life zones, that he was essentially, it was, it was very similar to if you started a journey on the Arizona-Mexico border and then went north up to Canada. So in terms of your um, latitude, thank you. <laughs> um, so anyway, kind of an interesting thing that we don't we don't always think about that, how, how much precipitation patterns do govern the plant species that are here. Okay, I, you know, being in the water education business, this is an opportunity to definitely talk about the fact that we do have declining water tables. We are dependent on groundwater here. That is where our water supply comes from. It's groundwater. Surface water is spoken for. It's headed down to the Phoenix area. And those, that's the supply, big supply for the millions of people that live down in the Phoenix area. But around here, it's strictly groundwater. So just to bring your attention here, this is a 10-year period from 1994 to 2004. And these are the uh, how much the water table has dropped. Um, so you can just look at that here up, up here. These orange, orange is between 30 and 15 feet in 10 years. This is just for the last 10 years. Guess what? They were already going down before 10 years ago. Okay. Um, all right, so we have that rescue area. Um, we're supposed to attain in 2025 this uh, theoretical Oh, um, situation of what's called safe yield, where the amount of water coming into the ground, recharging into the ground, equals what we pull out and not more. We're not going to get there. We're, we're nowhere near close. So we have a problem. Um, and guess what? It's not just the Prescott area. It is anywhere you're, you're, de you're dependent on groundwater. All of it. All of us are dependent on groundwater. And so, um, this is the Verde Valley, the middle of Verde. And again, we have a similar situation where we have, oops, well, where we have water tables dropping. So, um, sometimes people ask, ask me, well, isn't it getting taken care of? So I, well, you know what? We're educating, 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 but you know what? <laughs> That's all I'll say. It's a big, it's a, it's a big thing. So there's a lot of, a lot more educated, education to do. Okay, but let's just think about mm -hmm. our harvesting and what it might be able to do for us. Sorry, but I'm not getting a new way to that. Um, so how much water can we harvest here? General rule of thumb, one inch rain on a 1,000 square foot roof yields 600 that's something for you to think about. I love keeping that big of my mind because what we often do 
you see is we see, um, okay, it's great if you put a 55 gallon drum underneath a downspout, but you know what? It's gonna start raining and that puppy's gonna fill and then it's gonna overflow and you're gonna go, oh, darn, there it goes. <laughs> hey, but then you can slow it off on your property. That's probably the first measure is just think about how you look at your landscape, the lay of the land, the topography, and 90 degrees to the lay of the, the slope, try to think about how you can channel it better, how you can retain some of that water in place. Um, okay. So, we're going to ask you to only take one per family. Uh, this is that program called rainwalk.org. And these are great. Um, you're going to get one of these rain gauges. But they're, I've had one for several years, and I find that they, um, they don't freeze uh, very easily at all, and that's usually a big problem. Um, because of this wedge shape, when the water freezes and expands, it tends to not go laterally, it goes up. And um, it's in tenths of an inch. Is it in millimeters? It should be in millimeters. Yes, it is. So measured in an inches in English. And so, there's actually, you can set up an account uh, for yourself online. I really love this. I've been rain logging for a number of years, and I garden, I have a little vegetable garden, and I love to print out my, my, um, my yearly chart. After the year's over, I print out the chart. Or you can print out any time, any time, you don't have to do it at the end of the year. But basically, you know, from one year to the next, you can kind of look and see, wow, I really did read a lot that I didn't remember, you know. It's just kind of fun, another way to keep track. And they'll send you an email and remind you, hey, we think it rained in your area. And somebody else um, submitted some data. So basically all you do is, you know, you go in there and you go, oh, it rained a quarter of an inch, and you put that in, and you forget about it. And then you, you can just do it. So what it is, you're becoming citizen scientists. You're helping to augment that, that um, data, um, that that data set or information, right? The more information, because you know very well, haven't you ever seen it rain over there and then over here? You're, you're sitting over here and you're going, oh, come on over, but it doesn't, right? right? Especially in the summertime. All right, is it legal? Yes, it is. Um, actually, I have a paper that is on, um, the southwestern states, well, it's, it's Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, and how they're all dealing with the legalities of rainwater harvesting, and every state is different. So, um, but anyway, the rule here is if the rain that falls on your property, if it is headed to a defined natural channel, it is already appropriated. That would be surface water that somebody else has a senior rights to. And so uh, a natural channel, banks and beds that are naturally formed. Um, if you live by a creek, you would probably be in that situation where you really have to you know, look at it and go, oh, maybe this is prior appropriated water. I have talked with people down in SRP to, to make sure, you know, uh, just they, they know they know we're doing this workshop and and I wanted to get on board with them too to make sure that you know we um, I, I you know try and stay informed, right? Um, so would it have to be like a wash, something yes. really visible? Yes. Not just like yes. next to a creek. A uh, creek, a wash, a dry wash. That is. Yes, that is a, a natural defined channel. But if it flows down the gutter into a natural channel, <coughs> it's, it's okay. Right? Well, um, so, oh, go ahead. Well, if you were going to say something, go ahead. Yeah. Me? Yeah. I was just going to say, if you interrupt that by allowing some of that to sink into the earth, would you let it exit exactly right. where it was exiting before? Is that okay? Right. Yes. Um, you know what? Well, so that is an excellent question because really, remember, it would probably evaporate. 
So if you can cause it to infiltrate, that is going to benefit the creek. Groundwater eventually does feed springs that um, and, and, and feed surface waters. Many places around the world, they're actually um, creating some of these infiltration areas and causing streams to run again, streams that have gone dry. So, um, so even though there might be a surface uh, senior rice holder further down, downstream from you, um, you know, if you're causing, instead of that water evaporating, if you're causing it to infiltrate, that's actually a benefit to that ground, to that surface water user further down. Yes? I heard as long as you let it flow through your property, you don't hang on to it, you're okay no matter what. As long as you just let it go through. Whoa. Well, there is some consumptive use when you're, so that was, uh, I, um, when I initially, I put in my rainwater system, I have some pictures of it, but I had um, somebody asked me, they said, well, wait a minute, that would be water that would go out onto the landscape and you're using it now, you know, you're, you're using it wherever you're putting it. Um, but, you know, you're, you're still creating effluent. You're still creating, I'm not, I don't use it for my potable water system, but so that's kind of, kind of never mind. <laughs> um, but yeah, so your question is. No, it was a statement. As long yeah. as you let it flow through, I, I think that's what I heard, you're okay. Well, I, I would go further. If it's in the defined channel, you can't remove it. Yeah, right. right. If it's on its way to the defined channel and you can hold it back and slow it down, that's perfectly legal. And so it's once it's in the defined channel that SRP actually in the Verde Watershed owns that water now, once it's in the defined channel. But if, if it's flowing across the land and you can slow it down, get it to infiltrate, get it to do anything, that's fair game. Can you get it to flow into your rain barrel? Yeah, of course. Uh, as long as it's sheeting off of a, a, if you can't put it into a rain barrel if it's flowing in a defined channel. So, Once, right. yeah. so let's, 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 um, I appreciate all the, the questions. And, and, and the reason I think we're gonna continue to have this discussion is that um, what's appropriable has been argued among all those different states. There have been numerous court cases that have you know, tried to ascertain what's appropriable water that means it's already spoken for. So um, when I talked to the representative of SRP, he, you know, he put appropriable question mark. <laughs> so you know, for the time being, we can't, you know, as, as long as it's not in a, de, a defined channel, if right by a creek and that water would, would, would augment the creek right there directly, you know, then um, you're, you're okay. When you say defined channel, you mean defined natural channel? Defined yes. natural channel, okay. that's correct, yeah. All right, so, um, so you must consider prior appropriated water. Can't end up in a natural channel, um, and we all, Always check with your local jurisdictions as well. Just a disclaimer there, I guess. Are there financial incentives? I actually, um, I, I don't think that there are any in Cottonwood. Um, Prescott does have a financial incentive, a $300 maximum credit for a system that's at least 450 gallons of storage. There was an Arizona test, um, and I just wanted to let you know about it, even though it's, it went away. But if somebody put in a system a few years back and said, oh, I got a tax credit, there was one, it went away, okay? Whether it will come back, I don't know. <laughs> Another thing you might hear about is macro rainwater harvesting. There is an engineering firm in the Prescott area that has been, um, has proposed this uh, idea of harvesting water on a very large scale and addressing some of our water needs um, and the impacts on, on our groundwater supplies by capturing runoff and, and, um, and in, in causing that water to infiltrate. So there are a couple of pieces of legislation that have been signed by the governor just recently within the last couple of months. 
Um, there's a pilot st a study that's going to be taking place in Yelp Pike County. Um, my understanding is there are six one-acre plots that they are going to treat with some impermeable surface and then collect the sheet runoff from that and, and infiltrate it. Um, the plan is to actually, I've heard them talk about a six square mile area. So I just want you to know about it. We're, when we talk about rainwater harvesting, we're normally thinking micro scale, domestic scale, but you might read something in the newspaper that refers to this larger idea. And I really think that it's still something that really needs to be critically studied um, with any kind of action of that size. There are things to consider, and I don't think it has really been studied um, very thoroughly yet. Um, study committee, that's more about, um, I think some of the water that they want to catch off of a large project like that, they want to be able to have, ADWR would have, um, oversee that macro rainwater harvested water, and then um, give out water credits for new developments, or water, it would be a water supply. So anyway, just want you to know about the fact that there is this legislation and this alignment stuff you're looking about. Yes? Is that study going to be done in, in this valley or the one on the other side of Angus? That study, the study committee, is down at the state legislature. Still it's state legislature. But, there is a state where, study committee. The yeah. demonstration project will be at Chino Valley. The demonstration yeah. project, they have identified it for Chino Valley. There's one in the San Pedro and one in Chino Valley. Right. Yeah. Yes. Okay, local example. All right, so I, you know, if you're like me, I'm going to learn best if I try it and see how it works. You know, you're going to learn as you go. So I did, I, put, I bought a tank that's a 1,200 gallon tank, that's my house. I bought um, at um, Restore, the, you know, the Habitat for Humanity, I bought my piping, I got the, this is a leaf catcher, catches the leaves, um, deflects all the large organic stuff off the roof before it goes into the pipe, and into my tank. Um, so we receive 12 inches of precip a year in Chino Valley. I only have um, half of my roof is plumb to go into the, the rainwater tank, and it fills on a regular basis. Um, so my plan is to, to, to plumb the other side too at some point. So from half the roof, I can collect 3,600 gallons. Here's a learning experiment. It snowed this late spring, and it turns out, uh, I looked at that and I went, oh, good thing I uh, I have my rainwater on the other side of the roof, because this is the shady side, and that, you can see how the gutters are completely covered by the ice, it's it's all iced now, the snow just turned into ice, you know, icicles, and uh, so that's not going to drain into, I have uh, gutters, but I don't have a tank. So, like I said, learn as you go. It's just, if you have, if you're thinking about a section of roof that you want to plumb, um, you know, you, you might want to think about, I don't know, you don't get that much snow over here in the Green Valley, really, do, do you know? Chino doesn't generally as much as Crestwood, that's for sure. What? What's that? Think about what? Um, think about what? This is, uh, think about the aspect in terms of the other side of the roof has a southern aspect, it, it, um, so that snow on that other side melted and drained into my barrel. Thanks for asking. Well, we're going to find that. Ours on the north side and the Williams Valley melted into the Uh huh. So it just kind of depends. I mean, it's just, yeah. you know, it's good to study your site. Just study your site. Um, I think what Nadesh is saying is that sometimes it's a met if it's a metal roof, it'll just it'll slide just right off, off and miss your gutters true. completely. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And also, it just formed these icicles to where, yeah. anyway, yeah. But yes, it will slide off too. It's, it's a minor consideration. <laughs> okay, this is my garden with my drip system. So I just did this exercise before the last rainwater harvesting workshop. I thought, I want to really figure out. You know, my garden uses 120 gallons per day. It's very, very low, um, low volume. I mean, I, I have, it's um, very low pressure. 
and so five month growing season and it just figured out um, how much water I use on my garden. My goal is to collect rain from the whole thousand square foot roof, which would be 7,200 gallons. So for me, that's like, okay, I use 1,800 gallons. I raise a lot of my own food and that's really important to me. Oh, I wanna be able to do that. So I wanted to see how realistic is it. So 7,200 versus 18,000. So it's not even half, but you know what? That's less groundwater that I have to pump, and less water that I have to pump out of the ground. So if you, and then my domestic use is about 30 gallons per day. So let's say I have a garden and I was just wanting to totally rely on rainwater. Um, there is a whole, you know, we're not, we're really not advocating the use of rainwater for, pot for a, as a potable water supply. If you wanted to do that, there are ways to treat the water and um, University of Texas at Texas A&M, they have a lot of tutorials on, um, they have a wonderful rainwater harvesting site. And I think Mark has the link to that website as well. Yes, sir. How do you figure out how much garden, how much do you use in your garden? Did you okay. do it by pencil or did you just do it by how you? What I did is I know, so if I were um, taking it from the faucet, I know how much I apply in a two hour period with my faucet just so turn on so. Uh -huh. So then I took off took it um, took it off of the uh, she went from actually and then I just I went much. in and I measured it by okay. hand uh, okay. how much per minute. So I'm trying to figure that out now. That's yeah. Right. yeah. Right. So it's a yeah, like, yes. Okay. okay, how do I go about doing this? It's, yeah, it's, it's a fun okay. exercise. Um, um you know, the other thing people should think about the birdie is if you're Water on the ground, you probably are taking arsenic and other soluble materials out where rainwater would not. Yes, yes. So that is, yeah, water quality. And you know, when I uh, earlier in my presentation, I said, you know, water, water supplies are stressed in terms of the amount of water available, but water quality is an issue. Um, always think about, um, you know, for using this water in your landscape. Um, the soil itself does help filter um, and clean water, um, but if you're trying to use it as uh, well, anyway, water that falls through the as rain is distilled water. If we had an area that, say, you live close to a power plant, for example, um, and that rain is washing through the atmosphere and picking up sulfur dioxide would become acidic rainfall, right? Um, so there are some considerations that water can become polluted as it moves through the atmosphere if you have dirty air, right? So that's just definitely something to think about. The surface upon which you collect is also important. Um, but generally, if you're using it on your landscape, the soil is going to help filter out some of those pollutants if it, there was any. Yes? Since you're so into experimenting, an interesting experiment would be to mulch half your garden like three inches thick and see what the differential of evaporation of water is. I am so glad you mentioned mulch because my garden now has mulch on it. Mulch is key to gardening, definitely. So this shows no mulch. And you're right, I haven't done the experiment, but I, yes, I heavily mulch everything the evaporation from the soil from happening. So I'm glad you brought that up because that's really key. Um, oh, there's the garden. Just so you can see that it does a pretty productive garden. All right, so other considerations. Rainwater is naturally distilled. A lot of towns are dealing with stormwater runoff. We have all these impermeable surfaces, parking lots, roofs, when it rains, especially torrentially, that water just is, it's a nightmare for the people in the city that have to manage stormwater runoff. And in the Prescott area, all that goes directly to the creeks, and then it heads out to, um, it actually goes out to the sewage tree, uh, well, it goes through Grand Creek and overloads, it just overloads the whole infrastructure of the town as well. And so now the whole thinking is create more 
perme uh, more permeable surfaces, surfaces that allow um, the rain to infiltrate into the ground. So anyway, stormwater runoff can be decreased by capturing some of the rainwater. Um, it can help address some of the uncertainties of prolonged drought, growing population, and changing climate. Electricity savings, if you're taking less water out of the ground and pumping it, you know, using energy at electricity, um, you're going to realize some savings there. I like to know that I have a supply of water in case the grid went down. I mean, I'm not crying, you know, it's crying wolf or whatever, but it it's, you know, it's just nice to know. It's a nice little safety net to know that, wow, I've got some water, right? Um, and then the other thing I could put up here is gray water. Uh, you have a, a flyer in your brochure that um, is on gray water. So gray water, this is a brochure that is a most recent one. It's for the use of gray water at your home, so the domestic gray water. Um, if you go to the inside and you look on the very far right, um, the second to the last paragraph, it says, in general, no city, town, or country may limit the use of rainwater if the use is allowed by this general permit. You don't have to apply for a permit. It's just that you have, you can collect up to, I think you can use up to 500 gallons, I think it is. What is it? Four. 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 Thank you, 400. I was trying to find it. Um, so gray water versus uh, black water. Black water is from your toilet. Black water is from your kitchen sink. Uh, you cannot use that kind of water on your garden. Um, there's too much organic material in there that would grow microbes. But gray water from your washing machine, from your shower, those are the two main sources that would be excellent to be, you could use them. Um, so another way to another recycle, one, reuse. Can't store Right, it has to infiltrate, it can't stay on the ground, it can't be a place where mosquitoes can, can um, breed, and right, you can't store it, you have to use it. I'm having trouble with this filtration or washing before you break it. They'll plug up lines and sprinkle it. Uh huh. Anybody know anything about how to filter? Yeah, don't use one of the sprinklers. Well, we just use, ahead, we use hoses, but it's still a yeah, I would. Well, we use three quarters. Gray water will plug anything, and right. anything with a small pore. So the, the ideal thing is to you know, pressurize. Like from your washing machine, you can keep it pressurized from the, the, what's coming, what's already coming out of your tank. Um, but then you want to have a large opening on the outside, so that, so that it can't plug. That's the only way to do it. And there are there are ways to do it with pressurized systems. And I'm pressurized. I'm happy to talk with you afterwards, but you need to have big valves and not small fittings. Great. Yeah. And that's great. It's so great to have these folks in the back that can help you address specific concerns. And um, Yes? Yeah, I just have my washing was and then I yeah. just yeah. grabbed it to feed it to the Yeah. Ground. I have it out to my yeah. trees. Uh, you can't spray it on any fruit trees. It's going to be... Um, only citrus and nut trees are the legal things you you can apply it to as far as food crops. It's legal. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And, and, but, you know, <laughs> it's also policed, but it's not policed by the Department of Environmental Quality. But if somebody called you out and said you weren't following the letter of the law, they could technically come and say you're not doing this right. The other thing is you have to have a valve that'll divert it back to a conventional system, too which is usually the big hitch on retrofitting and why most people just use their washing machine water because it's easy, it's quick, and it, you don't have to do a lot of changes to your system. Yes. I have one question. If you put like Clorox in there, is that not good for the garden or is that also not good to the garden? Right. <laughs> so but okay. you have to Yeah, right. 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 Okay, so basically, okay, what are we waiting for? Let's go catch some rain. I'm done with my part of the presentation. We're going to take a five to ten minute break. Again, bathrooms on the outside. Catch us if you have questions. Please visit the um, tables in the back and then we'll recap.